So we've learned that the macroscopic very flux interval k prime hat is equal to the chern simons coefficient. So we get a version of the famous formula of tk and n, the coefficient k of the quantum Hall current, which in our presentation is the chern simons coefficient, can be computed as a flux integral of the Berry connection. I'll make two further remarks. One is that in the first lecture, Charlie Kane talked about the polarization of one dimensional system. That has a similar macroscopic treatment to what I've said. Second remark is that I just want to remember that TKN and N originally formulated the result in terms of k prime, not k prime hat. And they deduced it by a direct evaluation of the Kubo formula for the conductivity. effective action. So if you like, yeah. you, by going to arbitrarily, by contemplating the limit of very large L1 and L2, we determine what K is. But because it is an integer, it makes sense to use it in, an arbit in a very big but finite system. Now, K prime hat is also rigorously defined in a finite system under the very mild assumption that the ground state is always non dependent But there is some fine print, which will become clearer tomorrow, which is that you need the gap from the ground state to be uniformly valid in the thermodynamic limit. Not in order to make this discussion valid, but to make it useful in the real world. So in practice, what we said is more or less universal, but it's useful for systems where we have a uniform gap of all one and all become large. Yeah? One over what? Oh, well, I didn't compute all the terms. It's a good exercise. So I computed one term in the transport that came from the chern simon term. You'll find the other terms are less important at long wavelengths. But I recommend trying it. But also, they don't really give Hall conductivity. Yes. Okay, I th the question which is being asked is, why did we get the Hall conductivity only from the chern simons term, rather than considering other terms in the effective action? Literally, the other terms do not give Hall conductivities. So I showed you that the chern simons term gives a current in the one direction proportional to the electric field in the two direction. Other terms would have given something else. For example, you could find a term that would give a current in the one direction that would be proportional to derivatives of the electric field in the two direction but not to the electric field itself. I recommend that exercise. Think through it and you'll see But literally other terms in the fact of action give all kinds of interesting things, but not whole things. I'll take one more question, but then we should wait a little bit. I showed what? For, for this, for the K-half prime. Yes. I said a variety of things, and I'm not sure which one you're alluding to. But I said one thing I said was that the e squared term, because it has two time derivatives, isn't important in discussing this adiabatic transport. Why don't you ask further? If, if that was not a correct understanding of your question, ask more at the end, perhaps. Now, yesterday we explained why a purely one-dimensional quantum electron gas cannot have an imbalance between left and right moving electron excitations. As a reminder, the reason was that in a periodic orbit, what goes up must come down. So the band energy goes through the Fermi energy as many times going up as going down. From a field theory point, point of view, that's needed because right moving gasless fermions without left moving ones cannot be quantized in a gauge invariant fashion. <coughs> So there is an adler bell jacquive anomaly, which tells us that the field theory wouldn't work if you have only right-moving fermions or only left-moving ones. However, one of the hallmarks of a quantum Hall system 
is that on the boundary it has precisely such an imbalance. The reason this must happen from our macroscopic point of view is that when we verify the invariance of the chern simons action under a gauge transformation, even a simple gauge transformation will fly a single value. We had to integrate by parts. So when a sample has a surface, the integration by parts produces a surface term, and the chern simons term is not valid. There's, now, in general, in the interaction of an electromagnetic potential with a material, there are boundary terms as well as bulk terms. So you should ask the following question. Among the many possible boundary terms in the effective action, is there a term that is not gauge invariant whose failure of gauge invariance would cancel what we get by integrating this by parts? So you should try to add a boundary contribution to the effective action where the thing indicated by question marks would be a polynomial in A and its derivatives. A polynomial in A and its derivatives because we want a local effective action. And it, of course, shouldn't be gauge invariant because its, it's lack of gauge invariance is supposed to cancel the problem that came from the bulk. Whatever you try won't work. It's an exercise I recommend. So there is no way with the local effective action to cancel the problem with gauge invariance. And that means that on the boundary there have to be excitations that first of all are gapless, so they cannot be integrated out to produce a local effective action for A only. <coughs> and secondly, they have to be anomalous, that is, they're not possible in a purely one-dimensional system. <coughs> So what fills the bill is precisely what we found doesn't exist in a purely one-dimensional system. Chiral fermions, right-moving gapless modes, not accompanied by left-moving ones. Remember, I told you that relativistic physicists know that chiral fermions in one dimension are anomalous, meaning their effective action isn't gauge invariant. So because it's not gauge invariant, it can't exist by itself in a purely one-dimensional system. But on the boundary of a quantum hole system, or the bulk action has a problem in gauge invariance along the boundary, what happens is that the problem with the chiral fermions can cancel the problem from the chern simons term. Now, since the failure of k times the chern simons action to be gauge invariant is proportional to k, the chiral asymmetry that's needed is also proportional to k. In fact, the hallmark of an integer quantum Hall system with the Hall conductivity of k is precisely that if n plus and n minus are the numbers of left moving and right moving gap plus edge modes, then n plus minus n minus is k. So n plus minus n minus is zero for a purely one dimensional system, but it's k on the boundary of a quantum Hall system. Well, we haven't gotten to crossing the boundary bulk gap. So We've got a lot more to say. The boundary modes have to be gapless. All I've told you about the boundary modes is that they have to be gapless, or else we would integrate them out and get an effective action. Yeah, and gapless means they have to somehow live at the Fermi surface. But we'll say much more about it. I think it will be better to ask after the derivation is finished. So I don't want to give a technical explanation of this formula from field theory anomalies. Instead, I'm going to give a couple of more physical explanations. One today and also one tomorrow. So we think of a quantum Hall system in the form of a long cylinder. In fact, for starters, think of an infinite cylinder. We introduce the same sort of twist parameter alpha as before. We can imagine there's a magnetic flux alpha to a solenoid that runs inside the cylinder. So that the magnetic field is zero, or at least independent of alpha, in the cylinder itself. But the vector potential integrated around the circle gives alpha. So the reason I gave two versions, the magnetic field through the cylinder, is either zero or at least independent of alpha. It depends on how you understand the quantum Hall system. So conceptually, we like nowadays the systems described by Charlie Kane, I think, yesterday, the Haldane type systems where no applied magnetic field is necessary. But if you think of a quantum Hall system as something that does need a magnetic field, 
you, you take that applied magnetic field to be independent of alpha. Anyway, to recapitulate, we take a quantum hole system in the form of an infinitely long cylinder, but we let it thread a magnetic flux alpha that runs inside the cylinder, so that the integral of the vector potential along the path alpha, gamma rather, is alpha. So this is actually the same parameter which we introduced before, the same twist parameter we used before in explaining why different versions of the Berry flux gave the same answer. And just as before, the parameter alpha is only gauge invariant mod 2 pi. So we adiabatically increase alpha from 0 to 2 pi with the scalar potential, A0, assumed to be 0. In fact, Charlie Kane described the situation. I'm just going to say a few more things about it. When we do this, the electric field, E, is the A dt. So as we increase alpha, we turn on an electric field that goes around the cylinder. So the electric field is this way. And therefore, in a quantum hole system, the electrons are pushed to the left or to the right, depending on the sign of k. Now, an early explanation of the integer quantum hole effect by Laughlin was as follows. We assume that when alpha is 2 pi, the system returns to the same state that it was in at alpha equals 0. So alpha equals 2 pi is equivalent to alpha equals 0. So it's physically consistent to assume that adiabatically increasing alpha from 0 to 2 pi returns the system to its original state. It's consistent to assume this, but a fractional quantum hole system is a system where it wouldn't be true, as I'll explain in a bit. But we consider a system for which this is true. So the system returns to its original state when alpha is 2 pi, but some integer number of electrons, well, each electron may have moved k steps to the left for some integer k. Since the cylinder has a finite circumference s, the number of electrons per unit length is finite, and therefore it's well defined to say that each electron has taken the place of one that was k steps to its left. So this was interpreted as the basic integrality of the quantum hole effect. The quantum hole coefficient has to be such that by the time alpha is 2 pi, each electron will have moved an integer number of steps to the left if the system is to return to its initial, original state. And a small calculation shows that this leads to the value k over 2 pi for the whole conductivity. Now let's consider a cylinder that's only semi-infinite with a boundary, let's say, the left end. So the thick line is supposed to indicate a boundary, but the cylinder goes off to infinity in this direction. The same parameter alpha makes sense, and we can still adiabatically increase it by 2 pi. And it makes sense to assume that far away to the right, the system returns to its original state. And moreover, since the quantum hole system is gapped, if we do make a measurement way down here, we'll see the same current flowing to the left that we had for the infinite system. So assuming only valence bands are filled, the picture way over here will be that each electron goes k steps to the left when alpha increases by 2 pi. But there's an obvious problem with pi lock when we reach the end. What happens to the electrons when they arrive at the left boundary? Well, they can't just accumulate there. Uh, part of the answer is that there are edge states, as we'll describe better, and electrons can go to valence states into edge states. But that can't be the whole answer, because since the boundary has finite length, only finitely many electrons can go into edge states of reasonable energy. So you keep bringing in more electrons and more and more electrons from filled states on the right, and there's this pileup. First, they will go into edge states of some kind, which we'll describe better in a moment. But from there, they have to move into valence states and start moving back to the right. That's the only cure for our electron pileup. So as electrons flow in to the left from valence bands, which are the bands below the usual bulk Fermi energy, they must eventually flow back out to the right in conduction bands, bands above the usual Fermi energy. 
Moreover, all this is happening adiabatically, which means that individual states are evolving continuously in energy. So it must be possible for an electron to evolve continuously from valence bands in the bulk to conduction bands in the bulk, somehow passing through edge states. So the spectrum has to look something like this, which I've drawn for k equals 2. So first of all, this solid region at the bottom is meant to be, well, the reason it's solid is since there is a boundary, I've only drawn one component of momentum, the component that goes from left to right, the one that's conserved along the boundary. But the bulk system had a two-dimensional Brillouin zone, and when we project it to the boundary, it fills the whole region. So the solid region is the projection to the boundary where you forget the component of momentum that isn't conserved along the boundary of all the bulk of the bulk band, the bulk balance band. <laughs> Similarly, this blob up here is the projection to one dimension of the two-dimensional conduction band. So forgetting the component of momentum that isn't conserved along the boundary, we bulk, there are bulk states that fill up this region and valence states and bulk conduction states that fill this region. But since the bulk is gap, the Fermi level is somewhere in between. But when we have this boundary, there was this electron pile. The electrons flow in from the right. They have to continuously get up into the conduction band and flow back to the left. So it has to be that there are boundary edge states, boundary states, that connect this bulb blob of valence states to this blob of conduction states. But the edge states only have a one-dimensional Brillouin zone. So in the picture, they give a curve where epsilon is a function of one momentum parameter. So I've drawn two curves by which an edge state, sorry, by which an electron conceivably could leave the valence band and continuously connect into an edge state and end up here. Now, I've drawn it as if the edge states are continuous, but you have to remember that since the cylinder had a finite circumference, the edge states really have a discrete spectrum. So here's a better picture. Each little bead on a blue line that goes from below to above represents an edge state that has a properly quantized momentum around the circle for some value of alpha. But now when we increase, adiabatically increase alpha from by 2 pi, each little bead will move and it will take the place of the next one. That's familiar from elementary quantum mechanics, but I also explained it sort of half an hour ago, that alpha shifts the allowed values of the momentum, and when you increase alpha to alpha plus 2 pi, each state takes the place of the next one. So <clears throat> as alpha increases to alpha plus 2 pi, each bead is shifted in position by one step, and if there are two uh, branches of edge states, as I've drawn, there will be a net tra charge transport of 2 when alpha increases by 2 pi. And that's the right answer if the bulk had k equals 2. If the bulk had k equals 2, then when alpha increased by 2 pi, each electron moved two steps to the left in the valence band. Eventually, there was a pileup, and they start filling these states. Each one of those moves up by 1, transferring two electrons to the conduction band. And then the states in the conduction band have to start moving back to the right. So under alpha going to alpha plus 2 pi, there's a net charge flow of 1 from the valence band to the conduction band for each right moving edge mode. So just as a reminder, a 1D mode is right moving if the epsilon dp is positive at the Fermi energy. So what I've drawn are right moving edge modes. And a left moving edge mode, where the epsilon dp is negative, would have produced a net charge flow in the opposite direction from the <coughs> conduction band to the valence well, a negative flow from the valence band to the conduction band. So if n plus and n minus are the numbers of right and left moving modes, the net charge flow, which is n plus minus n minus, has to equal k, the number of electrons that we're flowing in from the bulk. Now, there are a few loose ends in this explanation. So first of all, 
the one the edge modes that are important can't be defined in the whole Brillouin zone. Because the whole Brillouin zone is a circle, and for edge mode that's defined in the whole Brillouin zone, we have the fact that what goes up must come down. And they wouldn't contribute to n plus minus n minus. That was the fact we started with at the beginning of yesterday's lecture. So there might be edge modes that don't connect to the bulk states, but they, don't, they aren't important for this problem. The asymmetry comes from branches of edge mode that exist only in a finite range of momenta from p minus to p plus. What happens at the endpoints? Well, the answer is the same as it was in a somewhat similar example that we discussed at the end yesterday. The way a family of edge localized states ceases to exist is by ceasing to be normalizable. But when such a state ceases to be normalizable, that means it extends into the bulk, and it's really a bulk mode. So the endpoints of the um, edge spectrum are points where the edge spectrum meets the bulk spectrum. And of course, that's what we needed in our explanation. Because if the bulk spectrum didn't meet the edge spectrum, it would not have been possible for an electron to adiabatically flow from the bulk into the edge and then eventually back into the bulk again above the Fermi level. So the fact that the end of the edge spectrum, or at least the end of the important branches of the edge spectrum, meets smoothly into the bulk spectrum is part of what makes it possible to have adiabatic transport from the valence bands to the conduction bands through edge states. As I've said, at the end point of the edge state spectrum, the edge state is indistinguishable from a bulk state, so the, a, an electron can continuously move from the bulk into the edge and then eventually back into the bulk. There's one more point you might want to worry about. For this to make sense, the total Hall conductivity of empty bands must be minus the Hall conductivity of filled bands. Because ignoring the details of what's happening near the edge, whatever flows in and left has to eventually flow, in, flow back out and right. So filled states, or states that in the normal ground state are filled flow in, and what were formerly empty states have to flow back, and they have to flow in equal numbers. So that means the following. Well, it's a property of the Berry connection. Let A be the usual Berry connection for filled bands with curvature f. And similarly, let A prime and f prime be the Berry connection and curvature for empty bands. Then the trace of f plus the trace of f prime is 0, basically because for all bands together, there is no Berry curvature. So the Hall conductivities of filled and empty bands are this and this, respectively. And because the sum of the two traces is 0, the two types of bands have the opposite of Hall conductivities, so that it's consistent that what flows in eventually flows back out. Uh, let me ask to postpone a question so I make one more. Oh, go ahead. I'll take one question. They can't all cover the whole zone. There could be branches of edge states that do cover the whole zone. But there have to be some branches of edge states that end. They have to end, but could, is there anything preventing them from wrapping around the whole zone before they go into the upper band so that they actually do cover the whole zone? Uh, in that sense, uh, as far as I know, nothing prevents that. Okay. And then such a branch would pass twice through the Fermi surface, I think. No, only no, once. No, okay, it's just you're, right. A you're right. You're, you're right. Yes, I believe. You, I do not know any reason that can't happen. I do want to finish up by explaining one more thing, which is why a fractional quantum Hall state system does not refer to its return to its previous state when alpha increases by two pi. We'll go more deeply into the quantum fractional quantum Hall case tomorrow, but I'd like to explain this much today. So we'll use the same macroscopic model that we used before in terms of an electromagnetic potential A and a U on gauge field little a that only exists inside the material. So first, let's discuss how to characterize the state of the system for a given alpha. So 
We recall that alpha was defined as the integral of big A around the path gamma. And we can control that parameter in principle by varying the mag magnetic flux that's threaded by the cylinder. But there's an analogous parameter alpha hat that we can't control in the same way. Just like alpha, alpha hat is gauge invariant mod 2 pi. What can we say about alpha hat? Well, recalling that f is d of big A and little f is d of little a, or the ordinary electromagnetic field strength and its analog for little a, the classical field equation for the system is r times little f equals big F. And in the limit of an infinite cylinder, little a can be treated classically. Tomorrow we'll have more fun with a finite cylinder where we have to use quantum mechanics. But for an infinite cylinder, I believe we can just treat little a classically. And then in the gauge where both a zeros are zero, the classical field equation says that r times d by dt of little a is d by dt of big A. And therefore, integrating that formula, r times the time derivative of alpha hat is the time derivative of alpha. So when we adiabatically increase alpha by 2 pi, alpha hat increases adiabatically by 2 pi over r, and the system has not returned to its original state. Since alpha hat is gauge invariant mod 2 pi, OK, the system hasn't returned to its original state. We'd have to make alpha to alpha plus 2 pi r before alpha hat would return to its original value modulo the gauge transformation. And therefore, the whole conductivity can be smaller than the usual quantum by a factor of r. I think I wrote the correct classical equation. I don't think there's a shift in the equation. I'm not sure what you mean. What integration there, constant? There, the oh, sorry, the constant. I, I only determined the time dependence of alpha hat. I didn't determine the initial value of alpha hat. I showed that whatever alpha hat is at time zero, when alpha increases by 2 pi, alpha hat increases by 2 pi over r. So what I said was that the system has not returned to its original state when we increase alpha by 2 pi. We have to increase alpha by 2 pi r to make the system return to its original state. And that's why the, the quantum whole current can be r times less than it usually is. Alpha has to go around 2 pi r to make one electron move to the left. So there is some kind of rough analog of this picture, but the edge states can't be free electron states. And I think this is a good place to, OK. They have to be capable of transporting a fractional current when alpha goes to alpha plus 2 pi. I'm returning to their original state only when alpha increases by 2 pi r. OK. There is one more topic, but we'll leave it for tomorrow. Thank you. one question about an example, but more things can happen, definitely. I haven't drawn the most general possibility for what the edge state band spectrum looks like, but the invariant is that k will equal the number of right moving minus left moving crossings through the Fermi surface. You can draw more complicated pictures that I drew when actually one was mentioned in the previous question, and you're mentioning another. So right, starting from the kind of locally, not a Fermi sort of, sorry, Fermi level, change it. I don't understand the question well enough to answer. Maybe we can talk during the break if you want to. Yeah? Okay. Oh. So we continuously count the electrons from the left and from the right. Size to left, size yeah. and then electrons climb up yes. uh, to the uh, conduction end. So yes. Is there a channel that the electron can return to the uh, valence band? Otherwise, there will be accumulation of charge in the conduction band and depletion of electrons in the valence band. Well, it, for a semi-infinite cylinder, there's no completion. The, 
depletion. The electrons are flowing in from infinity, and they're, they're flowing back to infinity. Oh. So I, I drew the crack spectrum for a quantum Hall system with non-zero k. When I say the crack spectrum, I meant I drew an example of a spectrum that's correct. There have been two questions pointing out that more complicated things can happen. But you might have some fun considering the finite zone. They flow to the left, then they go up through edge states, they flow to the right, they go back down through edge states. You'll see there aren't any contradictions if you think more carefully. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank Professor Lutten again. <laughs> we have a fifteen minute break. Uh, so please come back uh, by eleven forty five so that we can start the next lecture on time. Okay.